few uh, routine issues to start with. Um, there's a public address system, so all those that are uh, here to speak, registered to speak, need to use the seat and the little table here and the microphone is in front of you. If you press the button, that activates the microphone. Um, could people please ensure their phones are switched off or are on silent? There's no fire drill planned. Uh, the proceedings this evening are filmed and will be available on the WBC website. Uh, you'll see from the camera position that uh, the committee members, council officers and speakers will be filmed, uh, but if a speaker specifically wants not to be filmed, they can ask to, that's the case. Uh, the planning committee consists of 11 elected members, borough councillors, uh, who actually represent all four political groupings on the council. And we're supported tonight by uh, professional council officers. Uh, on, on my uh, far right is Callum Wernham, who is the Democratic Services Officer. He's the clerk to the meeting tonight. Next to him is Mary Severin, who's the borough solicitor, to give us any legal advice and guidance we may need. Uh, immediately on my right is Councillor Chris Bowring, the Vice Chairman. I'm Simon Weeks, I chair the committee. Uh, on my left is uh, Marcia Head, Planning Manager, and next to her is Judy Kelly, the Highways Development Manager. And the planning officers who are presenting the application tonight are sat to the left. Um, this is a quasi-judicial committee, and we have set formal procedures and conduct. Firstly, the planning officer will present the application. Then I will call in turn only those that are uh, agreed that can speak. Uh, please come forward to the table as earlier explained. Uh, please stick to your time limit. It's a maximum of three minutes. And I would remind you that we're interested in the quality of what you have to say, not the quantity. So don't feel obliged to use all three minutes. Um, the uh, members of the committee, as I say, uh, will then listen to the points that are raised and we will then deliberate and try and make determination on the applications. Um, I would just point out that the, it is not the planning committee's role to suggest alternative schemes or to suggest schemes are not needed or should be located elsewhere. Our, our role as the planning committee is to make decisions based on the planning applications as presented to us tonight. Um, so with that, we'll go straight on to the main part of the meeting. Um, I have the minutes in front of me. Members, you have cited the minutes in your agenda. Do any members wish to make any changes or modifications? Councillor Ross. Thank you, Chairman. I've just noticed on page nine, <coughs> towards the bottom, um, my quote there, uh, it says that I added that once the Southern Distributor Road was completed, it would allow for safer access from Nine Mile Ride. Safer access than from Nine Mile Ride. Does it just adding the word than would, would satisfy. Yes, that's correct. The one at Crossfield School. That application is withdrawn and will be returning to committee at a later date. Thank you, Chair. The application number is 192420. This application is for the proposed change of use from warehouse to mixed use of warehouse, of light industry, and offices, along with extension of first floor by increasing ridge height by 1.75 meters, as well as installation of two number of silos, new external doors, and solar panels. It is presented to the committee because it is a major development involving creation of more than 1,000 square meters of employment floor area. This is the site location plan. The site is located to the southern side of Molly Miller's Lane within an existing industrial and commercial neighborhood. Residential properties on Finchamstead Road are located to the east. The applicant, that is intersurgical, is one of the major establishments within the borough 
and owns three other properties in, on Molly Miller's Lane, as identified on the map. These are the existing floor plans. The building currently operates as a double height warehouse with a small section facing Molly Miller's Lane has two floors of ancillary spaces. These are the existing elevations of the building. Now these are the proposed elevations and I present them to you before the plans because the elevations show the exact changes that they're proposing. The elevations show that the proposal would only result in an additional height of approximately 1.8 meters in the form of a double gable. Now, these are the proposed ground floor plans, which will include a section of warehouse to the rear, B1C or light industry or manufacturing units in the middle, and offices in association with the business operations to the front. The roof extension is proposed to accommodate a new first floor or a mezzanine floor. So this is the proposed first floor plan. The warehouse is at the rear, which would have double height. The middle section is manufacturing and the front section would have offices as well as staff breakout areas. This photo shows the view of the building from Molly Miller's Lane. And this photo shows the eastern side of the building Residential properties on Finch Hampstead Road are sited to the right beyond the fences. As you can see, the shared boundary is sufficiently screened with existing vegetation. The overhead power line is more than five meters from the building, and the proposal will not result in the building being any closer to the boundary or overhead power cables. This is the proposed site plan showing parking provision Existing 72 spaces are proposed to be detained. While this doesn't fully comply with the council's parking standards on its own, in this instance, it is considered acceptable since total spaces available combining all four intersurgical sites will commensurate with number of employees. Moreover, the site is highly sustainable in terms of availability of public transport. However, since the parking arrangement is reliant on availability of spaces within other intersurgical sites, a personal permission is considered more appropriate in this instance. This will be secured using a Section 106 agreement. There are no other concerns to the proposal. In terms of members' updates, there are a few members' updates. So the first one is the Section 106 agreement to include personal permission as well as employment skills plan contribution. Uh, the transport assessment report and workplace travel plan reports are now removed from the approved documents list because we have uh, seeking more details as conditions. The condition five, that's construction management plan, now includes an additional clause saying, Molly Miller's Lane should be kept clear of construction traffic at all times. So to conclude, this development wouldn't lead to a harmful impact on the character of the area, neighboring amenities, highway safety, landscape, or protected species. And it is recommended that this planning application is approved subject to conditions for the reasons set out in the report following completion of the Section 106 legal agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjuti. Um, and could I call Emily Temple, agent, to speak on behalf of the applicant? Thank you, Chairman, and good evening, councillors. I'm pleased this evening to support the application for the expansion of Intersurgical's business in Wokingham. As members may know, Intersurgical is the second largest employer in the town after only the council. The business has been located on the Molly Miller core employment area for over 20 years, and it is world renowned for the manufacture of medical respiratory equipment that is used in private clinics and hospitals worldwide. The company do have premises in Lithuania, but they are proud to have their company headquarters right here in Wokingham. With the NHS being the Intersurgical's largest client, the ability to manufacture and deliver medical equipment within the UK is of paramount importance. 
and the demand for such products is rapidly increasing, as the NHS is almost wholly reliant on intersurgical products, such as respiratory masks and associated tubing. By way of context, the company currently manufactures over 2 million adult masks per month and over 100,000 respiratory tubes per month. The expansion of the Wokingham facility is therefore a fundamental part of delivering the NHS's growing need. Intersurgical, as you've seen on the map of um, different uh, premises, they recently acquired a larger B8 storage building elsewhere on the industrial estate. And this smaller site and the close proximity of it to Crane House and Ready Power mean that it is well suited to the proposed change of use and extension to accommodate more manufacturing capacity. The number of premises that Intersurgical have across the estate means that parking can always be accommodated all on applicant-owned land, even if not on this specific application site itself. It is relevant that most of the building will be occupied by machines rather than high numbers of extra staff, although some additional employment and apprenticeships will also result from the development. We've engaged with your officers through all of the recommended conditions and the legal agreement and can confirm our agreement to all of these requirements. So I hope uh, my comments are reassuring. We trust we've worked well with your officers to date through the application process and request that their positive recommendation is supported by the committee this evening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Right, members, this uh, application, as you will see, has uh, raised uh, no objections from the town council or local members. Uh, there were two letters received from neighbours adjacent to the scheme and uh, the, their comments are made and uh, addressed on page 23 and 24 of your report. Um, I don't think we have a ward member here, so I'll throw it open to members who wish to speak. Andrew. Thank you, Chair. Um, I applaud the inclusion of a very large number of solar panels on the roof. It's not clear to me what the plans are for Crane House and what impact future activities there might have on parking overall across the intersurgical site and nearby areas, but I suspect we're probably just going to have to suck and see uh, on that issue. I do have a potential concern over the erection of two silos to the rear of the existing building. I would like more information about their purpose, how they contribute to noise, and whether they are replacing or additional to the silos at Crane House, and if additional, would the cumulative impact of increased noise levels be adequately covered by Condition 4 relating to noise mitigation? Thank you. I think we'll take those in turn. Sanjuti, could you address the issue, I think, primarily of the silos? The silos are new. There are no existing silos on this site at this moment. Um, this site is different from Crane House. There are two silos existing on Crane House, which is across the road. If I can show you the location plan, as so you can see, this is the site, where the Crane House is over there. So the proposal is to bring the operations currently going on in Crane House and move them to the site here. The silos, there are two silos on Crane House at this moment, those will be, there'll be two similar silos on this site. So, yes, and the noise report has been submitted for this particular proposal. It shows that the noise from the silos will be the expected noise to the nearest receptor, that is, these houses on Fincham State Road are six decibel more than what is expected, the permitted level. Um, however, it's stated that there could be um, noise mitigation measures which can reduce the level. So a condition is included as a pre-commencement condition to ensure that noise mitigation measures are in place prior to the develop, uh, commencement of the development. Does that answer your point? Unlike on the Crane House site though, um, the new silos will actually be located quite close, or much closer to, uh, to residences. Should that be a concern? Well, I guess one thing we shouldn't lose sight of is that the site, all aspects of the site, are entirely held within an industrial estate. So the industrial estate is long established at that location. And therefore, you know, on an industrial <coughs> estate, 
that you would expect to have some some noise generated by it, but that you indicated six decibels different from normal sound levels and that there's a condition to mitigate against that. Okay. Okay, Stephen. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to get some clarification on this issue that's mentioned in the update about um, uh, making this a personal permission. Um, and, and is that literally personal, personal to this particular applicant, or is it personal to... It, it, it's personal to intersurgical, because, as we've heard, the, the site, collect, the individual site, does not provide sufficient parking, but the collection of sites they have has more than enough parking capacity. But the concern was that if we make the condition personal, it avoids the situation where at some future date intersurgical perhaps decide to sell off one of their buildings along with the parking and suddenly we have a, we're faced with a parking problem. So this means I, a new I, applicant would need to make a fresh application to address that. I understand all of that, Chairman, and I, I wasn't concerned about that. I was just trying to work out whether this was an applicant. Uh, the applicant is, is a named individual. We're not making it personal to him. That was what I was worried about. I think that, that is the, the contact for the applicant, but I'm sure <coughs> the Section 106 agreement will name the company, not the individual. Is right. that correct? And I'm sure that would be normal practice, Mary, wouldn't oh, yeah, it? Sorry. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, okay. right. So you can, you can be a person even though you're a company? signs it will be an appointed officer of that company but it's not it's not personal to mr philip glover as far as i'm aware thank you chairman um you echo on, on high restriction between the park cable and the roof of the building is there any legal restriction um legal requirements that between the restrict um height from the roof of the warehouse up to the cable where it's going yeah just would like to clarify on that. Are, are you talking predominantly from a health and safety point health of view? Health and safety and yeah, fire, yeah. in case. Uh, because obviously we saw in the photograph the cables were comparatively close to the building, but could you clarify that, please? So the building is not getting any closer to the power cable because the footprint is not changing. So if I can use this, so the power cable kind of runs here, yeah. and the building is going up vertically by 1.8 meters, so it's, there is no difference in terms of the yeah, proximity to the power cable, if that's. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've just got to say that, I mean, m most of this uh, application seems good, you know, local employer, um, increase in floor space, increase in employment. Um, it's a slightly taller building, but it's not massively, I mean, there's no overlooking or anything like that. Um, and, and it's really taller just to the ridge heights, which are, you know, they're gabled, so most of it isn't even that height. Um, but I do worry about the noise. Um, uh, the condition is, is about mitigation. W what happens if they build this and there is no mitigation that can be uh, done to, to make this uh, come down below that level? I think it has to be five, is it five dB below the, the normal level? Um, that's why it's a pre-commencement condition, unless the applicant can demonstrate that the le noise level is achievable, they can't start, start. start the development. So, yes. So we wouldn't have a situation where it's done and then they say, oh dear, we can't reduce the noise. So it's as, you, as a pre-commencement condition, that would avoid that. All right, Get, all right Gary? Yep. Yeah, picking up on that particular point, um, is the condition four with respect to noise mitigation for construction or is condition four to deal with, for example, when the building is up and running in the future uh, and delivery hours, delivery times, etc. In other words, can they deliver, uh, make deliveries late at night which can cause lots of noise and therefore um, be a nuisance? So I was just saying, does, does condition four cover that element of it? Um, the other thing I found odd was um, it, it makes a reference to, on page 14, readily available public transport, and I would like someone to expand on what readily available public transport is on Molly Miller's Lane. 
Um, and the other comment I would make is that it may, uh, there is a condition about keeping construction traffic of Molly Miller's Lane, and I don't see any point in that because I don't think you can keep vehicles off highways when they're legally entitled to be on them. And I've lived in Arpfield Garrison, and I've seen this on for years, where we've tried to have conditions and we can't. So I think having that condition there is actually, I think, is a waste of time. Okay. Uh, and the other, the other final point is car parking. Um, there's, there's various references to numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I would like in all, all future plans, including this one, to show some indication what facility there is for precise numbers of electric charging and disabled car parking, because it tends to disagree with that. And the other thing is the removal of the travel plan, I think, is wrong. I mean, historically, what we have done with travel plans is we've allowed the um, chairman to approve a travel plan. And I think removing the travel plan as a condition, I think, is wrong. I think the travel plan should be made in there, and it be approved by you as chairman. Okay. But otherwise, I'm perfectly happy with the okay, application. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll let St. Judy answer most of that. But just in terms of the issue about Molly Miller's Lane, I think the wording, when I actually looked at it in the members' update, when I got to the meeting, I thought that it was perhaps not very well worded because clearly construction traffic will have to use Molly Miller's Lane, and the way it's worded suggests it can't. So I would suggest that it should be the wording should be modified to say that it should be kept clear of. Uh, parked loading or unloading construction traffic. Uh, in other words, we don't want vehicles parked there loading and unloading, then get onto the site to do it. But clearly, vehicles will have to use Molly Miller's Lane to access the site. So I think that hopefully addresses your point. So if we could make that minor modification. So St. Judy, could you try and answer the other three points, please? Thank you. So as I understand, the first question was regarding the noise and the noise um, the noise mitigation. So the noise um, we are expecting is from the silos, primarily, which is when the building is under operation. So the noise report suggests that when the silos are on operation, the noise level created by that will be six decibel more than what's permitted. It's because of that, we need a noise mitigation uh, plan. So that's been conditioned as a pre-commencement condition so that we have a mitigation plan and which has been checked by the council officers and we are happy with that and only then the development can commence. That's the first question. Now for transport on Molly Miller's Lane, it's within walking distance of the railway station. The application site is less than a mile from Wokingham train station and there is a bus stop within 40 meters of the application site. So the workers can take trains and buses and they don't have to really drive. And the applicant has given a travel survey report which states that 64% of their employees actually drive, rest 36% take public transport or walk. So that's quite, um, we have calculated the parking requirements based on this. Did I miss any other question? I think the other point I just make is that I think it, uh, you see detail in the report that the result if this is approved will result in three additional staff because it's a rearrangement of the staff on the site. So I think the impact on parking or traffic is, is going to be minuscule. Right. I did make a point about the travel plan. I said, why, why, why remove the travel plan? It's a pretty standard document we do in all planning applications. And for some apparent reason, there's a desire to remove it. And I don't see the necessity to remove it. I'd rather a travel plan remained. And again, um, you talk about the uh, uh, bus, bus down Fish Ponds Lane. But I mean, I have no idea of the bus, the number of times, whether it turns up in time for work or is there when people enter. I'd, I'd be interested to know the number of the bus. Is it number 12, 14, 23? Does it come twice a day or twice a month? If it comes from Fish Hampstead, twice a month. Okay. Well, all the buses from Fish Yes, the travel plan is not removed from the condition. So as you can see, the condition 11 is still the requirement of travel plans. It's just that um, in the actual um, uh, agenda in my report, I had included the travel plan submitted by the applicant as approved. However, after consulting with Judy and other highway colleagues, we thought that it's all the details provided in the travel plan 
are not fully, um, it doesn't cover all our concerns. So since, because I have conditioned the travel plan in the uh, actual planning permission, we thought it's better to remove it from the approved documents. Thank you. This may be a wonderful question. What in the world is a silo and what's going on in the silo? The silo, the only things that I know of, they store grain and they're round things and they're very tall. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on in these that are making the noise. And second of all, since are they going to discontinue what's going on in Crane House and their silos or will be another additional two silos and we'll have twice the I think the, the applicant's noise? agent made the second point clear that it's additional. Yes, I know that. But yeah. I'm trying to be specific. yeah, did you want to add something to that? Right. In that case, I think with no one else indicating to speak, we'll move to uh, the recommendation. Uh, members, you've uh, asked a series of questions and got some clarification on this. We've seen there have been uh, two objections, and I think those have been addressed in the report quite clearly. Uh, and I would ask whether you're prepared to support planning application 192420. Could you please indicate? Yes, with the, with the amendment as indicated. So that is unanimous. Thank you very much, members. Our next application is Headley Road East. And Graham, I think you're doing this one. Members, I, I would draw your attention to the fact there's quite a lot of detail in, in the members' update relating to this particular application. Bear with us a moment, please. of Headley Road East in Woodley and is part of the Headley Road industrial area. In policy terms, it is within a major development location and a core employment area. The buildings on the site have since been demolished. However, an area of landscaping, including trees protected by preservation order, is located to the front of the site. The application is for the erection of a builder's merchant building and two further uh, mixed-use buildings comprising of B1B, B1C, B2 and B8 use. This results in the site having two distinct areas with the builder's merchant to the east and other units to the west. These areas will be accessed separately from Headley Road East and two areas of landscaping, ensuring that the TPO trees would remain, uh, would be provided adjacent to the road. The appearance of the buildings would be of a typical uh, industrial or commercial style. In terms of the principle of development, the proposal is for multiple B uses and sui generis use, although this is very similar to a B8 use. It's considered that this is appropriate for a core employment area. It is acknowledged that there is a loss of floor space compared to the previous buildings on the site. However, the proposal will provide employment, ensure the site is not vacant, and replace old style buildings which were in need of modernization. As such, it is considered the proposal is acceptable in principle. With regard to character, the proposal would be appropriate in the surrounding context being of an industrial use and appearance. Additionally, the landscaping area to the front and the retention of the, of the trees protected by TPO are considered uh, benefits to the scheme. The access, to the, site, uh, the accesses to the site are considered appropriate and the traffic impact is also considered acceptable following assessment of TRICS data. 
In terms of parking, the provision of 21 spaces for the builder's merchant building is appropriate and relevant to similar size examples. In relation to the other units, further information is set out in the members' update. As can be seen, highways have now raised an objection to this aspect of the scheme and consider additional parking should be provided. It is the view of planning officers, however, that the parking provision is acceptable, particularly as the buildings are for B1B and B1C, not for B1A use. Furthermore, taking the highways objection into account, it is considered the benefits of the scheme outweigh this. In terms of other issues, the site is not located adjacent to residential properties and therefore no harmful impact would occur. Satisfactory information has been submitted with regard to flooding and drainage and in particular the EA have recommended a condition regarding unknown contamination. Furthermore, subject to conditions, no objection is raised with regard to tree and landscape, environmental health, ecology and sustainable design impacts. A contribution to an employment skills plan will be provided through a legal agreement. In the members' update are alterations to conditions, uh, including some additional ones, and uh, clarification on the parking provision as stated. As such, the recommendation is that the committee authorise the grant of planning permission subject to the completion of a legal agreement and the conditions set out in the officer report and members' update. Okay, thank you, Graham. Um, again, members, I will draw your attention to the uh, that there are no objections from the uh, town council or from local members or from any neighbours. Uh, I suspect there aren't many neighbours in that immediate area anyway. Um, and that this application is, is simply here by virtue of its scale and size. Um, Carl, I'll come to you first. Speaker. Think, uh, sorry, speaker, sorry, apologies, jumping ahead. Um, uh, Laura Wilkinson, agent. I'm so sorry to have nearly missed you out then. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you regarding these proposals. Your officers have prepared a very comprehensive report which sets out all the pertinent issues associated with these proposals. I therefore only have a few comments to make. The previous existing employment buildings had reached the end of their life and were not suited to modern employment requirements. The proposed development would provide new employment buildings and opportunities on a designated core employment area. The design and scale of the proposed buildings would be similar to the surrounding uses and therefore compatible with the character of the area. The proposed development would provide suitable access, parking and servicing arrangements. With regard to the parking associated with the five industrial units, 53 parking spaces would be provided. These buildings will be used as either B1C, B2 or B8. They will not be B1 offices, which have a much higher employment numbers per square metre. Any B1A office element will be ancillary to the main B uses on the site, and it has been clearly demonstrated as part of the submission that 53 parking spaces would indeed be sufficient. There are no objections to the proposal from the Environmental Health Officer in respect of noise or other disturbances. There are no objections from the Council's Tree and Landscape Officer with regards to the impact on the trees covered by the Tree Preservation Order. The trees to the front of the site would be retained and protected during construction. There would also be some additional planting introduced to the site as indicated on the submitted landscape strategy. This will be in the form of a double row mixed native hedge along the fence line of the builder's merchant. The applicants have also agreed to the Section 106 financial contribution to cover the employment skills plan. Discussions regarding Section 106 are already underway and it is considered that the agreement can be concluded quickly. Finally, as the Chairman has already mentioned, there are no objections from the Town Council and no letters of objection have been received from local residents. Therefore, in view of the above, I would respectfully request that you endorse your recommendation and grant planning permission. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, you were the only speaker, so I now come to you, Carl, as ward member. Thank you. <clears throat> um, this, this is a, a loss of Class B floor space, uh, which is a problem, but it is an employment use in a, a, an established employment area, and that was definitely one of the worries I was hearing from not local residents, because there aren't that many right next to it, but um, people worried that, uh, that this was going to be kind of another bit of housing in an industrial area, which has happened to the south of this. Um, the bakery that used to be there was turned into housing. Um, and I, I think one objector to a previous application on this site referred to it as a progressive nibbling away of the designated employment area. So the fact that this is actually going to be an employment site is, is a good thing. I think that's welcome. Um, the other issue on the kind of local grapevine was the trees. Um, I think uh, I did get uh, asked to look into this, and I 
when they started to, to look like they were demolishing the site, when they started putting the boards up. And uh, I spoke to planning, and, and very quickly, uh, the guys were out there to check it. Um, and I think they had protected the TPO trees, but there was a bit of worry that they just were going to go ahead and, and saw them all down in one go. You know, that, that would have been a problem. So I don't think they were going to do that. But the planning guys went out and just made sure, reminded them, <laughs> and, they, and, and that never happened. So that, that's good that's, that they've retained. Um, uh, a couple of questions. Originally, they put out an application for prior notification in to demolish the buildings uh, in October 2018. That was refused. Um, and I think that was refused because of the trees that they hadn't carried out. Uh, and I just wondered, I don't think they needed permission to demolish. So I just, I'd just i like to know how that happened, really. Um, I mean, this is retrospective permission for demolishing it, so they're asking now, obviously. But I'd just be interested to know how that, that works. Um, uh, not that I have massive objections to that, uh, although I have a small one, which I'll come to later. Um, and the other question is... Um, on page 59, paragraph 34, uh, it, it's talking about the SIL liability, saying it applies to residential and retail uses, uh, but for sui generis and fee uses, it's not SIL liable. So I, I re realise that the builder's merchant is sui generis, but how is that not a retail? <laughs> uh, a builder's merchant does appear to be retail. Uh, obviously, there's a reason why it, it isn't retail, and, and I'll just let that explain to really. Thanks. We'll get an explanation of that. I would point out that whilst I appreciate, yes, there is an element of retail, it is classed as a sui generis use, so, and in planning terms, so it isn't an A1, A2, et cetera. So it, it doesn't fall under that class uh, in terms of SIL. I appreciate there is that element, but it is not enough to call it a, an actual A use, so it just doesn't apply. It's to do with the, the proportion of the use, really, is it? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, okay. Are you satisfied with that, Carl? You kind of mean because it's a builder's merchant and most of it will be storage, effectively, like a warehouse, I suppose. It, it won't actually be, uh, although there is a retail element, it's not a massive one. Uh, okay, yeah, I understand that. I have got another point to make, uh, you know, I'm broadly in, but I'll, I'll come, I'll let other people speak. Okay, let's go for it now. Uh, it's about the Hawkehurst House, really, which was the old building which was demolished. Um, uh, and I consider myself uh, guilty of this as well, but I think as a planning authority, we're guilty of this that this was a building, it wasn't listed, and not likely to be listed either, but um, it, it does have some history, and I think it would have had some uh, parts of it which would have either been worth documenting or certainly saving uh, in terms of there was a very fine stone doorway uh, which would have uh, been, been good to save in some way, or if it was possible. Um, and it, it just, I just wanted to make the comment that I, I, I felt that, you know, knocking that down without it kind of being checked over was a, was a bit of a problem, really. I don't think there's anything, they've done anything wrong. It wasn't illegal to do that, I don't think. But um, I, just, I just think that's a shame. And I just wanted to get that on record, really. Um, because it's one of the few buildings left, or was <laughs> one of the few buildings left in Woodley, which, which had a bit of history to it. Um, and its history was, you know, to do with the flying school um, it, and later the flying training uh, uh, squadron there. Um, and also it was later used as a main office for uh, the furniture company that built up there so, so it's, there's a lot of history there and it would have been nice to have it at least documented um, so it's a shame but it's already gone so uh, you know I, I don't think I can protest too much about that anymore thanks this is more curiosity than anything else there's only one other building merchant in there is it Travis Perkins that's moving in here and are they closing the other site uh I don't know. Um, I'm not sure entirely if it's relevant to the planning application. The agent may be able to answer, but I, I don't know, I'm afraid. As far as that goes, I've been to their other site previously, and there was always plenty of parking, and it wasn't more than those spaces. There aren't that many people coming in to pick up things, I think, there. It's not B&Q or anything like that. Uh, 
Thank you. Um, fairly simple question first, then my main question. Uh, what's in Unit 6 as opposed to all the other units? Is it um, a different sort of uh, customer will be in there, different storage or what? So that's the builder's merchant building. In 6? In 6, and then Units 1 to 5 are the mix B uses. Okay, so if you have big lorries arriving, are they likely to be in both sites or just the one, do you think? Large lorries? I don't know if it's significantly large lorries, but ultimately the access has been assessed and considered appropriate it's for... it's 15 metres here, type. isn't it? It's normally 10 metres for an entrance, it's 15. So I'm assuming they're expecting some lorries and things to go through, if it's building materials. The, the reason for asking the question is that there's the two halves to the site. The one on the right side, by Unit 6, has a, a one-way system. You go in and go red, a big red, about to come out, that's easy, which means that you go in forwards and you come out forwards, if there's large vehicles on the other half, on the left-hand side, um, if they are large, I'm not quite sure how they would be able to turn around and get out in a forward direction from that gate, because there doesn't seem to be a turnaround point unless the road is very wide or there's turning points. So any idea how, how they're supposed to turn around and get out, or is that not relevant to that half? Yeah, it's a highway question, I realise, but... Just having a look at the um, swept path plan. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have, have to say, look what, at the plan what, 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 what Judy will just look at that. But I would say that, as, you know, as a as an industrial site, you, you would you would expect that the the road network there is designed to accommodate much larger vehicles and with the appropriate provision. But we'll. Um, um, Judy will just have a look at that, and we'll, we'll come back to that point in a moment. Well, yes, the third bit of the question is, how wide is that road in that case? Right, okay, well, we'll get, back, get the answer to that. Um, uh, next, I've got uh, Angus. Thank you, Chairman. Mine's linked to that, in a way. Um, it looks like there are six different accesses off Headley Road East in quite a short distance. Was it considered acceptable that these two, one to five and six, had separate accesses off Headley Road East. I think maybe Judy's still looking at the other things. So. Uh, yeah, we'll come, we'll come back to that. Can we come back to that one as well, the, the, the multiple entrances? Yeah. Um, and then uh, we've got Gary. I think the best way of starting this, if every time I speak on a planning application, assume I'm talking about disabled parking and charging points, okay? Right, okay. So that automatic we'll we'll I won't, say, future, right, I won't say ever again. I mean, the two issues for me on this, uh, all the other points I'm listening to, is um, looking at noise and its impact on the residents of Miller's Grove in terms of, and I accept there will be noise there, in terms of two things, delivery hours, and probably more importantly on page 51, piling. Um, I've been subject to... They've been subjected to piling during construction, and it just goes on and on and on. It's, it's very, very upsetting, depressing, and it's very, very noisy. Yet there's no reference whatsoever, as far as I can see in here, that there's any control over when the piling takes place, what the hours of the piling is, will people at weekends, etc., etc., be subject to piling and well, late at night? Well, and it's a very noisy process. Okay. Well, this application originally didn't have the the standard hours condition, I asked that that was added, and uh, I'm, I'm assuming that since piling forms part of the construction process, that it would piling would take place during the normal construction hours, which I think are eight till six, uh, five days a week, and on Saturday mornings. I, I'm not sure it would be practical for us to restrict piling further within that. Uh, as you say, it's, uh, it, it can be quite disturbing according to the proximity to other houses, but. The more you restrict it, the longer the whole thing goes on for. So it's a question of whether you have a, a few days of noise or a few weeks of noise. Uh, so I would think that I think the piling will be covered. Graham, would you confirm the piling will be covered in the the, the timing of piling will be covered by the normal uh, construction hours restriction <coughs> that, that we are attaching to this? Yes, it would. And there's also a construction management plan condition, uh, construction method statement condition, which would look into that as well. Oh, well, the, the, 
I must. I was a little surprised that you'd need piling on an existing site like this, where I would imagine there were, there's, you know, the, the the ground is fairly firm as a result of previous development. But so, Gary, your situation is immediately resolved. Can we remove the reference to piling then? Yes, we could. We could remove Thank the you. reference to piling in the, and the application. And the residents of Miller's Lane will love it. Uh, so I can't actually find any swept path plans for units one to five. Um, I mean, there is a wide area between parking bays that a large vehicle or a delivery vehicle could conceivably turn in, but um, unfortunately I can't seem to, it hasn't been submitted. Yeah. Well, I think that the delivery arrangements for the, um, the builder's merchant have that one-way system, as you say, and that's fine. But oh, in terms, that that's right on the right-hand side, unit six. Yeah. But for units one to five, we've n there's not been an exercise undertaken in terms of tracking a large vehicle. Um, so th for the builder's merchant, um, I believe they've got some gates. So the, this access surfacing condition is referring to between the highway and the gates. But for the units one to five, there's no gates. Um, and it's an existing access, which is in better condition, relatively speaking, than the builder's merchant access. Thank you, Chair. Um, the reason for refusal of an application for part of this site in October 2018 related to impact on protected trees. And this seems to be addressed in the new uh, application. The application is part re retrospective. I'm assuming this relates to the fact that demolition has already occurred and not to something more or in additional to that. Um, I agree with the Chair's recommendation for an informative reminding all applicants um, of the importance of not relying on uh, retrospective applications. I note that um, it would bring employment back to a currently unused site within a core employment area, and I think that's really important. It is acknowledged that the figures relating to parking are speculative, um, but note in the members' update that highways have since raised an objection, but Graham says that this has been um, addressed. Notwithstanding, I am a little puzzled by the argument made on page 57 regarding traffic impact. Yes, the site would have generated traffic when previously in use, but traffic in the vicinity has almost certainly increased since then, and it's likely to continue to grow. I think it would be really helpful if members could always be shown how these factors, uh, these have always been factored into the calculations. Notwithstanding, um, I personally see no reason for any additional informatives um, or for not approving the application. Um, so, members, we have the application in front of you. You'll see in the members update that there's uh, uh, additional information um, on parking provision and amendments to the report. There's the addition of the normal hours of operation. And uh, with the committee's agreement, I would like to add an informative, uh, just reminding the applicant that we have a strong preference that people seek planning permission before they do things. So, uh, is everybody happy to support this application? That's application um, 192826 on that basis. And that is also approved unanimously. Thank you, members. Right, so we now come on to uh, Woodside Caravan site. Now, members, just to review on this, this, this application we considered back uh, two months ago in November, and at the time, we were uncomfortable making a decision uh, because we wanted uh, uh, some information on the applicants, uh, what efforts the applicant had made to seek alternative sites. Um, that, in, 
information has now been provided, and that's in, in the report on page 75 at point four. Um, however, you also should be aware that this application has now gone to appeal on the basis of non-determination, i.e. we did not make a decision within the statutory time, and the applicant has therefore exercised their right to go straight to appeal. Um, I have no idea what the application's intention is uh, regarding uh, the appeal dependent on the outcome of this. So if we go straight across to you again, Graham, please. It would probably be fair to say we don't know, need to go into the same detail as we did because all members who are present today were also present for the November meeting. Oh, apologies, apologies. Um, you never normally miss meetings. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think you kind of covered a lot of what I was going to say, but I will just kind of give a very brief overview. Uh, obviously, it was considered at the November committee, and the application sought a variation to a condition limiting the occupation of the site uh, in terms of duration and who could reside there. The applicant has appealed on the basis of non-determination, um, and the planning inspector have confirmed that the appeal is valid, but have not started it due to waiting for a suitable inspector to be available. Once the appeal is started, notifications to residents and councillors will be sent. Uh, in order for a case to be presented at appeal, the committee are required to indicate what their resolution would have been if the application was being considered fully. Uh, to be clear that this would not result in a decision being made, as this can now only, be, only happen through the planning inspectorate. Uh, at the previous committee, uh, members deferred the application as they considered insufficient information had been submitted regarding the applicant seeking alternative sites. Following the meeting, a request for further information was made and the applicant stated that they are on a waiting list for another GRT site in the borough, but little movement on the site has meant a pitch is not available. Additionally, they are not considered a high priority due to already being on a pitch. They've also contacted relevant site owners across the borough, but again, this has not resulted in a pitch being available. The applicant also wishes to remain as a family, which currently requires three pitches. Uh, as indicated in the members' update, the applicant has also conducted a recent land search, but the plots are considered too expensive or not suitable for GRT pitches. Uh, in light of this information and the previous application submissions, officers would still have recommended conditional approval as set out in the previous report. However, in order to make a reasonable case at appeal, members need to consider whether they would have followed that recommendation and indicate the reasons why. Okay, thank you very much. Now, um, neither um, the applicant or uh, the objector registered to speak, uh, but since both are here and both have specifically asked to speak, we will allow you to speak, but I'd ask you to keep your comments fairly brief. Okay? <coughs> not, sorry? Yes, as ward member, sorry, yes, you're as ward member, you, so you're the last speaker, so no, no, sorry, don't, I, was talking, I said the applicant and the objectors, I didn't refer to ward members, so, so first you could ask uh, Philip Bain uh, to come and speak, good evening. Good evening, and uh, thank you for letting me talk to tonight. As residents of Blagrove Lane, we have always had one real argument against the approval of this site, and it's the location of it. The site is on a field that is sold as horse grazing land, not building or dwelling land. The proximity of the site to the surrounding houses is very close, and mobile homes and caravans can be very clearly seen from our houses. We do understand that these travellers need somewhere to live, but this site is not suitable and was never designed for the purpose. We feel that the local council need to do more work on finding a suitable site for these travellers to live in that would be respectful for their needs <coughs> and also respectful for our needs as residents. Over the period of the time the travellers have been on site, their requirements for more caravans and larger mobile homes has increased. Our concern is this will carry on and the site will need to be extended. We as local residents don't understand why the travellers need to be offered sites that are available only in this area, not on the outskirts of the area. 
And if they have been offered sites, why haven't they not been taken up? Is there a waiting list for a suitable site, similar to the council housing list? If so, are the travellers on the list and how long have they been on the list? These questions have been asked before at other hearings, but never truly answered. We would also like to understand why temporary approval keeps getting granted. Even after three years, we all understand that this site is not suitable and the travellers should be moved to a more suitable site for both them and us as residents. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And could I ask um, Letty Morn as well to speak? Back here again, I um, just want to say basically that obviously this is our home. It's not just a piece of grazing land now, it's become our family home. We have three families that live there. Obviously, as you can see, our family is growing. Our, our kids need a stable home to live in. Since we've last come to this meeting, you've probably read on the application that we've had a bereavement in the family. We want to keep our family together, not separated. We've been looking very hard to try and find somewhere where we can keep every one of us together. Because obviously, as you're not aware, my husband's family passed away when he was a child. So the family that we live with now are the family that brought him up from an infant. So we want to remain, obviously, together. I understand not everyone wants to look out and see travellers. But it's, to me, it sounds a bit racism. You can't say, you can't pick and choose who you live next door to. Yes, we might be from a different race, but we're still human beings. We, it's just, we're the same. So, obviously, I understand that he doesn't want us there. But we've been there now five years. The council clearly can't find us anywhere else to go. They've tried. We're on the waiting list. I've been on the waiting list for about the last three years. Not one pitch has ever been offered to me. There's been absolutely nothing that's come available. We've went to different people and asked them could they accommodate us. They can't. There was one site at Carter's Hill, which one of our family members, our extended family, went up there and they got evicted from there. The other families put them off because we're from, a, we're from an Irish background, not an English background. It's probably a bit complicated and it probably you don't understand it, but English and Irish travellers, sometimes there's conflict. <laughs> so they, they evicted them off. So there is literally nowhere else for us to go. We've tried, we've absolutely tried absolutely everything that we can. I understand, obviously, people, not everyone gives us a chance. Probably if he would have given us a chance, and it probably wouldn't have seemed so daunting to him that we was there, because if you don't know someone, then you, you don't know what... He's expecting us to be the same as everyone else that he sees on TV. Well, not. We've been there five years. He hasn't even given us a chance yet. We're normal people, all we want is a home for our kids. It's not just a piece of grazing land now. And as they say about the wildlife and that we're affecting things, the wildlife are clearly they're still there because our laurel, our, the deers are just completely devouring it, they're eating it. So clearly we're not having an impact on any of the wildlife. As in the last meeting, it was raised about environmental health, police activity, all this stuff. I've addressed, we've addressed all that. I've had to get reports from environmental health to prove that all them allegations was lies from the RSPCA. I've got reports to say that I'm, I'm not known to the RSPCA and never have been to prove that that is a lie because we want to be judged by who we are, not from what people paint us as. Thank you very much. Um, other than Carl, you've all heard what I said before, so I'm not going to repeat that. Other than to say, <clears throat> other than to say that this application breaks planning law, it's only the human rights grounds that have led to the temporary stay on this site. Um, there has been sufficient time to resolve this. This committee deferred in order to gather more information as to what efforts had been put into resolving the issue, and the response was for the applicant to appeal rather than actually work with the council on this, which I don't find very cooperative. The questions I have regarding the additional information are, actually, how long have the applicants been on the waiting list? It says three or four years. Is it, is it three or is it four years? It's a bit vague at the moment. 
have they been on the waiting list since the site was set up illegally or was it prior to them moving to it? If it's the latter, then where were they before? Um, I think it's something that needs to be answered. The report states that they're not a priority case on the list due to having a pitch. No, they don't have a pitch because the pitch is not supposed to be there. So how do we go about raising them on the priority list for a suitable site? And also, um, how does the nationality of site owner affect suitability of a pitch? We're just being told about the difference here between English and Irish travellers, but then also being told that residents are being racist. Um, I don't see how the rules can be different. If pitches are available, that shouldn't really be a factor. Um, one final question to leave you with is, should this committee decide to grant a temporary extension, what measures can be put in place to ensure that it means that it is temporary and this land will be returned to what it was? I don't know if it's in the power of this committee to do that, but it was temporary last time and we're at the end of that now and we still don't have a resolution. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Chairman. Um, I, I agree with Sarah that it is unfortunate that the applicant's agent has apparently encouraged them to go to appeal rather than wait for the determination of the application at this meeting. Um, we only actually deferred the application for, for one very specific reason, to get further information. Um, and the applicant has provided us with some information. Uh, which is helpful. I think if, if I read the resolution correctly um, from the last meeting, we were also hoping that the council itself would give us some information about um, current availability of sites across the borough. And I'm, I'm not sure we've actually got that. But uh, I think what makes all of us feel uncomfortable is precisely the point that Sarah was making at the end of her um, presentation, which is that we're faced with seemingly the, the potential for repeated temporary applications with no resolution of this and no strong incentive really for um, the applicants to resolve it if there can be successive temporary permissions. I don't think there's anything, unfortunately, however, we can do about that. I, I fear that's how it is. Um, we, we only defer this application for one reason, that's at least partially being um, uh, addressed. So I, I really now think we, we almost certainly have to, um, we have to pass a resolution saying that we would, had we the opportunity to resolve, uh, uh, to determine this issue, would have, would have granted a further temporary permission. I would just remind members um, that the, the decision, we need to make a decision on this, but the, the effective decision will be made by a planning inspector, not by us. Gary. Well, I, I did say on page 93 that um, uh, I suggest that the application be approved for a two year time period, which will be subject to a legal agreement and an additional condition regarding screening of the site and gate light pollution um, uh, be considered. I don't know what the current situation is with respect to the local plan <coughs> and GRT provisions for vacancies, whether within our structure we have any. Um, we're going through a local plan process, which actually I think on the 15th um, will go out to consultation on the new local plan. And that part of that will be looking at the provision of uh, GRT and um, Gypsy, uh, it's not Gypsy, a uh, GRT and um, f fairground uh, traveller pr provision. Um, but that's, that doesn't solve the problem uh, uh, that's, com happen, yeah, that's confronting us now. It won't happen for some time. I, 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 can't, I can't see much benefit in uh, uh, going for temporary extensions. I, and I do, I mean, I, I, coming from across the water, I recognise the difference in English and Irish travellers and the issues around them. And it's not as Sarah would imagine, quite simply plonk them all in the same place and it's all hunky-dory because it's nothing of the sort. It's actually quite different. Um, my, my, my recommendation would be um, along the lines of, the, of condition one, 
Um, but I would not like it as a condition. I would like it as a legal agreement that we grant permanent permission. I need to remind you, we're not making that type of decision today. We're simply uh, saying what we would have decided. I'll rephrase so, that. So, so we I'll can't start applying conditions No, no, to I'll, I'll rephrase that. If, and this is the question I was asked, if I was asked what approach would I take as a member of this planning committee, then that approach would be to, through a legal agreement, approve planning permission um, for permanent occupation of the site subject to conditions to which um, one of the which the legal agreement would state for the occupation of these specific people only, uh, persons only, and should they wish to change those conditions or leave the site, well then it would revert to countryside. That's what I would do if I was in a position to do it. I think you'll agree, think Gary, what you've just described is a, is a hypothetical situation. Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, um, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. We've been reminded a number of times tonight that the reason why a decision was deferred was to enable members to be provided with very specific information relating to alternative sites as outlined on pages 93 and 94. Uh, the, some additional information, additional information has been provided by the applicant since the 13th of November uh, meeting, and it's included under point four on page 75, but I do find the additional information that the applicant provided to be quite, uh, quite limited. Likewise, uh, the member's update um, also explains reasons why it's not been possible for the borough to find a suitable site. But I do agree with Councillor Kerr, the ward member, that it would be much better if much more information um, uh, on this matter um, uh, uh, could be provided. For well-rehearsed reasons, this is not a suitable caravan site. Notwithstanding, I note that the reasons for the planning spectre granting two-year permission continue to apply. Indeed, the heavily weighted welfare of children living on site is probably even more important now because of the additional children uh, living on site. In the apparent absence of an alternative site being immediately available, I do not believe that uh, we uh, can refuse the application. And uh, for that reason, uh, for these reasons, you know, I, would, um, I would support a further two-year uh, permission. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, let's go on you next. <coughs> I think we uh, ought to follow the logic of the last meeting um, at which we decided we wanted more information. So I think the quality of the information, as several members have already said, is important. Could I ask, um, could I ask Graham what his assessment of the uh, members' update um, reference to nine potential plots? Is that, is that corro corroborated by officers? Uh, we received it... Uh, beginning of this week, so we've not had a chance to properly assimilate it. Um, th there is an element that it's plots of land that have been looked at, uh, which essentially don't have the benefit of planning permission for a GIT site. Um, at the same time, the applicant has looked at what possible land, what possible alternative sites are available. So I, I think I possibly echo members in saying that yes, it is limited, but it is some information nonetheless. Okay, so in that case, I think the inf if the information we requested is satisfactory, then necessarily we must approve it, as otherwise we would have refused it without the information. <clears throat> so I, I agree with the other members. I think we must approve and um, give a two-year temporary extension. Carl. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, as I wasn't here last time, this might have been a question that was answered at the time. Um, uh, this app, it, it does mention it in the original uh, report here, but it doesn't make it clear. Was the original application here for a permanent position, a permanent permission, with no conditions uh, to restrict who may live on the site? Uh, and then there's, there's some comment about, but it would be acceptable if another temporary permission happened. But is this application for a permanent permission? My understanding is that this application is strictly for a two-year extension. The applicant made it very clear when they previously spoke or that they would prefer it to be permanent, but the application is for a two-year extension. 
Okay, that, that explains why it's kind of both are mentioned. I just wanted to clear that because obviously that's quite important. Um, I think... Oh, sorry, for clarity, sure. obviously there's quite a bit of history on this site and it's been to appeal on more than one occasion. Um, the, the, the original application, obviously the intention was for it to be permanent and inspectors have subsequently said, no, not permanent, but because of the applicant's circumstances, we'll, we'll give a limited, limited uh, uh, permission. I have a lot of sympathy with the idea that, you know, um, it, it's a temporary thing that rolls on and becomes permanent, effectively, um, uh, which is, you know, a problem. Um, my impression from what's in the report, and I, I take the point that, you know, it hasn't been checked properly yet um, because of the time, uh, and of course the fact that we have to make a decision now because it's gone to appeal means that we haven't got the time to maybe defer this again and talk about it, um, so, uh, and find out what that what actually happened. But the, the impression I get is that not a lot was done um, to provide that. Uh, that evidence really um, but also it does appear that you know there aren't that many options either um, despite us having uh, enough pitches available um, as far as what we're supposed to have available um, and in the end it comes down to you know the human rights thing about you know if we don't grant them permission they lose their home and that also then becomes our responsibility because then we've got to sort them out um, so that creates even bigger problems. Um, and I think the, even the human rights thing um, was talking about a, a previous case, which was uh, the Supreme Court referring to UN uh, conventions. So this isn't even a kind of European Court of Human Rights issue. It's, it's much further than that, according to what the report says. So we're in, we're in a position which we can't do anything but say yes to a temporary commission, I think. Um, one thing I, I see throughout the report, the previous report, that it seems there's various complaints about statutory nuisances on the site. Those aren't obviously planning issues, but it's clear that the local neighbours are complaining about a lot of things, and are they happening? You know, I think we need to make sure that you know those things are looked into properly, and that's you know partly the, the council's job, obviously. Um, but in terms of decision, I don't think we can do anything else but, but um, agree to another temporary two years. I hear all the members first. Um, Rochelle, next. Having been on the committee for a few years, I believe it happened, this thing came at least two years ago to us Three. before. And are, the question is, are there suitable sites that would meet all of the conditions that they need, including the fact that they're not with uh, necessarily a different group of GRT people who would be, who would be a problem? You wouldn't want to put two Northern Irish people right next to each other in, in, a, in flats. Uh, if one was Catholic and one was Protestant, it could be a problem. So I'm not quite sure that this is that different. But the, my question is, are there sites that they can go to uh, with spaces for all three families and uh, that are suitable for including the fact that they have to be next to, not next to certain other GRT people? No, there's no council pitches available and there's no privately owned pitches available. N nor, nor do we have sites that have got planning permission to be operated and they haven't implemented it. So there's, there is nothing currently on the horizon. Okay, therefore the welfare of the children do take precedence and we really have to approve the two-year extension at this point because there is no place for them to go. We can't make them homeless and... <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. I think it's interesting that uh, four members of the committee live in four wards, which have probably got the majority of the traveller population, and that's uh, Twyford, Arborfield, Finch South, and Woking Without. And I, I think we'd all agree that they don't all mix, uh, uh, and that is a factor. Um, I've got two questions. One, can we be just absolutely certain <coughs> the status of this land? It is outside the settlement? Yes, right. The other is, what, what would be the legal position? Uh, now, Mary always wants to get in on these things. If, <laughs> as a result of what we do tonight, uh, and the way that the, the, the committee is, seems to be leading, they then withdraw the appeal. 
frankly, that's their prerogative, and we've seen many applicants do that. They, they, they get a refusal, um, they go to appeal, and then they, they run with another scheme at the same time. So they're, in essence, regardless of who's doing it, there's nothing that stops people covering both options by having one application that's going to appeal and another one that's being considered currently by the council. I that understand that. Right. My, my question really is, would that then necessitate them putting in yet a further application to regularise the temporary mm -hmm. two-year permission? Yes. I, I just think we, we should be absolutely clear on that. That's why I asked the question. Um, whilst it's an issue of frustration for many, um, there is nothing we can legally do in issuing a temporary permission to say we will not permit we will not consider a further temporary permission. I have, you know, in my own ward, I have gravel quarries that have had three five-year extensions. So uh, art seeking extensions is not unusual, and it's not something that we can restrict because we have to consider each application on balance. Uh, Stephen, you want to? Briefly, uh, Chair, I, I know that we, because we're not actually determining a planning application, we can't put conditions on, we can't even put an informative on, but maybe this is the moment to say that the logic, just to emphasise, it's clear in the report, that the logic of a two-year uh, extension is to give time for alternative sites to be found. I think that's quite important to say that. Yes, I can't add any new points because we're more than adequately covered by everybody and I agree with them all. Uh, I think it's uh, rather unfortunate that it keeps coming back every two years uh, and, and we're basically not given much of a choice. We can only approve it effectively uh, and we have every reason to assume that it will be back in two years asking for another one uh, without resolution. Uh, so our hands are tied. I think we're going to have to agree with it. But I would uh, agree with the latest point uh, made on the other side of the room, where with two years this time, is there any way that we can get uh, from both the applicant and our own officers uh, a fairly intense effort to find almost anything that matches and meets and is properly checked so that there's a, a proper evaluation before what is almost certainly to be yet another two-year application? in the coming up two years? Well, um, it, it's not for us to seek sites for private individuals. They're free to make whatever attempts they can to seek a site. But as a council, in our local plan update, which will be the draft of which will be published shortly, we are uh, obviously, there's a call for sites, for suitable sites to be considered. And that's something that may well happen further down the line. The council is in a position to increase the number of sites it currently has beyond the current two. Uh, but for reasons already well rehearsed and stated, most people choose not to have a gypsy or traveller site on their doorstep. And so it's, it's always a challenge. It's always a challenge. I, I, I'm afraid I'm, I, I'm not a clairvoyant. Right, do any other members have any key points to make on this? Uh, do any members wish to put forward an alternative resolution? Uh, in that case, members, I would ask whether you uh, would in indicate whether you would have supported application 192128 for a two-year extension at this site. Could you please indicate? And that is unanimously carried. So the choice is now the applicants whether they run both the appeal and have a two-year extension or whether they drop the appeal and run with a two-year extension. But either way, I would just remind the applicants that this is not a permanent permission and that we expect you to be looking, continue to try and strive to find another site in that period. Thank you, members. We now move on to the last application because the Crossfield application is withdrawn. And that is um, Sorbus House on the uh, Mulberry Business Park off uh, Holly Miller's Lane. Uh, right, and we have people registered to speak for this as well. So, um, Simon, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Simon, straight across to you. Thank you, Chair. The application is for the erection of a four-storey residential flat building comprising uh, 38 units, or up to 38 units, six one-bedroom, 32 two-bedrooms, 
59 car spaces surrounding the perimeter of the site. Um, built to a height of 11.3 uh, to 14 metres in height. Um, the site is surrounded by um, several prior approval residential office, con office to residential conversions undertaken under the permitted development route. Um, and that's illustrated here in the plan on the screen. It's also in the um, agenda. It's also evident if you look at the um, aerial view here, you can view the Molly Miller's core employment area, um, the buildings to the north and the e east and the west of the subject site of the, the buildings being converted. And you can see the residential on the surrounding areas. Now this application is um, outline, outline only. So the consideration is for the principle of development and the access to it. Uh, but it also needs to take account of um, whether or not the building that is proposed could be accommodated on the site in the manner it, that it is. Um, three submissions, uh, you'll, you'll read in the members update, the three submissions have been received since the um, agenda was set. Uh, an objection was raised by the ward member and from Wokingham Town Council. The main concerns that these being that the site is not suitably located for residential development, is too far removed from facilities and services. Um, and that there is a lack of affordable housing. Um, other main issues that are identified are that it, it is the principle of development. It is contrary to policy in terms of establishing residential development in a core employment area. Um, on that point, the markability of the site has demonstrated that it hasn't been able to be um, let or um, there is a, a, sorry, there is a permission for the site for office development that has um, expired. The marketability indicated that that wasn't um, uh, worthwhile, so there were no tenants that came forward to, um, to enact that consent. Um, and it also felt that the neighbouring area being prior approval office uh, to residential development warranted uh, residential development on this site. Access is considered acceptable. Subject conditions, conditions including core um, construction management plan and condition nine requiring additional parking details. Con contamination of the site is evident. Um, so that is uh, conditioned in condition three. There's also a section 106 for affordable housing and employment skills plan. Moving to the objections. Um, affordable housing is discussed in the um, members update to a degree. Um, it was felt that an offsite um, commuted sum was acceptable in this instance given the location of the site and the council's desire to provide more suitable affordable housing in better locations and with a better unit mix. Um, and it was felt the location of the site in relation to um, supermarkets at the top of Fish Point close uh, access to Wokingham train station and bus services was acceptable. The other main issues being neighbour amenity just quickly demonstrating here, there are surrounding buildings that will be office converted, uh, used for office conversion. The site here is to the rear, the site here to the, to the front, um, and these buildings are to either side. Um, you'll note in this, the bottom photograph, that, that is a building currently under conversion to office, uh, to residential. Uh, the only final point I'll make is that the height of the building at 14 metres does exceed the eaves height of surrounding buildings, but it is generally in accordance with the ridge height or lower than the ridge height of other surrounding buildings. Um, the scheme is recommended for approval on the basis that the surrounding area is, is undergoing change to residential um, and it is a better outcome for the site as a new build where the, there is provision for outdoor amenity space um, and better internal amenity whereas and provision for affordable housing whereas the prior approval uh, approvals in the area have not been uh, afforded those are, um, requirements, thank you. Okay, um, just before we come on, Simon, can I just pick up on something? I may have misunderstood you. I think you referred to the building as being 14 metres, uh, but on page, uh, on uh, point 33, it says the building with a flat roof and a total height of 12.1 metres. So could, before we go any further, can we just get clarity on that? I thought the 14 metres was a nearby adjacent building. Sorry, that is correct. It, it is 14 is a surrounding, uh, a neighbouring building. So just to be clear, the building is 12.1 and there are 
there's a building nearby which is 14.1. The, I'd call Paul Smith, the applicant's or the applicant's agent, who wishes to speak. Good evening. Chairman, councillors, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on behalf of our proposal. Over the last six months, we've worked closely with planning officers to make sure that we have addressed planning issues that would arise with our application. We submitted a pre-application request for advice and have worked collaboratively with the case officer during the development of this application. For example, we have made significant changes to increase the amount of amenity space as recently as last week. The sound basis of our proposal and the efforts we have made to meet planning requirements have resulted in the case officer recommending the application for approval. As the case officer notes in his report, we are proposing to develop a site previously occupied by an office building. We understand that the building burned down some years ago and has never been rebuilt. That has left, as you saw on the photographs, an unsightly area of scrub and wasteland. Despite intensive marketing, there was no appetite for commercial occupants for the space and therefore the permission that was granted, which expired in October 2018, was never enacted, correction, 2019 was never enacted. To build on this site will improve the outlook for residents of the other buildings on the Mulberry Park site, which, as the case officers mentioned, all have prior approval for conversion into residential dwellings. One, Ilex, has already started. One behind Mulberry has also already started. And Indigo House will start in March stroke April. It will also add 38 dwellings, most of them two bedroom, into an area where the majority of conversion apartments will be one bed or studios. This was, I noted, a, a, an objection that the town council made about the Indigo prior application. So that addresses one of the town council's issues about diversity of size of unit. We note and take seriously the objections raised by Councillor Kerr and the local residents, and we have addressed those in a letter that we sent to you all, but I quickly wanted to summarise our responses to the various objections. Lack of amenities. Objections contend that the local infrastructure, schools, nurses and doctors' surgeries are not adequate for new flats or residents in this location. From our research, there is a large number of nurseries within the local area, some 20 within <coughs> 1.5 miles of the town centre. And there are, there are good schools and at least two large doctors' surgeries. In fact, the case officer makes the point in his report that this is a sustainable development, well served by local amenities, and should not be considered in a negative light as a result of other developments in the area. To check the idea that there was an issue with the doctor's surgeries accepting new patients, I called Woos Hill Medical Centre and the Wokingham Medical Centre this morning. Both confirmed that they were accepting new patient registrations, and they made it clear that there appeared to be no issues with capacity of new patients at the, either practice. If this development is approved, we will be contributing to the community infrastructure levy, a significant sum of money and one which the council is obliged to spend to improve infrastructure and facilities in the local area. Turning to the Thames Valley SPA, the development is sited outside of the five kilometre buffer zone and does not trigger the requirement to contribute to SANG or SAM within the local area. Parking. As the case officer notes, parking, 59 spaces, is in excess of the requirement from the, uh, the parking requirements generator and will include disabled parking and a significant number of bicycle spaces. We will also, as part of our requirement to reduce carbon emissions by 10%, be providing electrical charging points. The site has sufficient room for emergency vehicles and refuse collection vehicles to operate and the highways had no objection. Affordable housing provision. As noted in our letter to councillors, it was the planning authority that suggested the affordable housing requirement should be achieved by the way of an off-site payment rather than on-site. To quote, due to the location and type of units proposed, we would prefer to seek a commuted sum in lieu of on-site affordable housing. Nevertheless, we are actively in discussion with affordable housing providers on how we may deliver the site in the future. In summary, this is a vacant site previously occupied by an office building that had lapsed permission to be rebuilt. 
it is unlikely to sustain a commercial enterprise in the future. This is evidenced by previous marketing activity and indeed low occupancy, even when there was an office building on the site. We think it makes great sense to develop the site for housing and as a recommendation for approval shows, the planning officer agrees. The logic is reinforced by the surrounding buildings being converted under the prior notification legislation and we have worked hard to achieve good design and incorporate all the planning requirements and changes requested by the case officer into this sustainable proposal and I re requestfully respect, res respectfully request even, that you approve it. Thank you. Um, now we have two ward members due to speak. Um, have you agreed amongst yourselves how you're going to share the time? I thought we were having a separate slot each. Right? You're having a separate slot each, but totaling five minutes, the oh, same okay. as the applicant has had. So, so um, if you want, if I don't know whether one of you wants three and one two, or we can tell you when two and a half minutes is passed. How would you like to do it? Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, this application is obviously for a large development outside of the local plan. Um, I'm getting notification after notification of other office buildings in this core employment area, repeat that, core employment area, converted into residential units, and this is obviously due to per permitted development rights. There's nothing we can do to stop this due to the law. Um, the Molly Miller's trading state in the very near future is set to no longer be a core employment area, the rate of these conversions. This particular application, though, is not permitted development because of the office having burnt down. It's a new build. Therefore, unlike the other applications, we can actually do something about this one. You have a choice tonight, a choice, decide with the developer, or to do something positive for the residents of Wokingham. What I can say positive about this application is, yes, it is a brownfield site. Its proximity to the town centre and mainline train station are good. And I do recognise that when we're approving planning applications, these are things we should be striving for. However, what is being done about the loss of business sites? Uh, business space. Where is the new land assigned for the business use going to be to replace what's being taken here? The fact that other units are being converted is not enough of a good reason to say, OK, let's go against our planning policy on this. Actually, to the contrary, I think. One of my biggest concerns in the fact is the fact that in this borough, our local amenities are already stretched to the maximum. Please remember that whilst this application is for 38 dwellings, there are hundreds of other dwellings being created in this core employment area that don't have to meet our planning requirements and they too will be wanting a piece of what's left of our amenities. I can talk from experience about how long it took to get my son into our local oversubscribed school 300 metres away. I can tell you the number of complaints I get from my residents who cannot get a doctor's appointment, work in a medical centre, we still practice, they may be accepting more patients, they can't get an appointment. We cannot cope with the housing quota we have, with the amenities we have, let alone if we approve these additional properties. And what about the amenity space for the children? Talking Leslie Sears playing field, you can't actually access it from Fish Ponds Lane, and people are not going to walk around to use that. That's more cars on the road. There's nothing in the vicinity. I'm not happy about the um, affordable housing. Um, it's unacceptable that we're just gonna, they're going to lump us some of money at the council. We need affordable housing all over the borough, and we need to stop letting developers pass the buck. You may have noticed the lack of comments from members of the community. Please don't let this be a sign of disinterest. Yes, the consultation process was done correctly and 144 neighbours received notification, but just properties 2 to 10 Reeves Way are the only habited residential properties that received that. The rest were offices or offices being converted that don't actually have people living in them. So that is the reason for that. To sum up, the officer notes on this item states, it is noted that this site is located within a core employment area where the level of facilities and services is limited. However, the site retains a suitable level of sustainability to services and facilities in surrounding areas. On the one hand, we're being told that there are issues with sustainability, and on the other hand, we're being told that it's acceptable. As a member of this community, I'm telling you, it's really not. Thank you, and uh, Councillor Diane King. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you for allowing me the time to speak on this. When I first started to look at this application, my reaction was actually that it would be a good use of previous office building space, particularly as it al had already been partly de demolished due to fire damage. Only 38 houses, close to local facilities, and with reasonable car parking. So I went along to the business park to look at the exact location, 
surrounded by large office and industrial buildings on all sides, many of them still in use, some of them in poor condition, I decided it would be a very strange and unpleasant place to live at this time. Granting planning permission for one isolated building in this situation seems inappropriate, but of course, likely to be used as a precedent for others wishing to gain the same permission. I note from the agenda that the business park might be considered for residential use in the future. If this is the intention, then it would surely be the time to decide numbers, facilities, access need and appropriateness for the Wokingham area. So I would like the committee to consider refusing this application tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. So that, that concludes uh, those registered to speak on this application. Um, before we come on to speakers, I just want to just remind members of a, a couple of points just for clarity, and then I'll let you all have your say. Um, we've heard reference to the fact the site uh, has already seen a series of conversions that are either agreed or ongoing. Um, personally, I've don't like the permitted development arrangements that the government has allowed for office buildings. And that is for a couple of very clear reasons. Firstly, and this applies to the other buildings that surround this site. Firstly, there is no affordable housing provided when this happens. Secondly, there's no community infrastructure levy provided when this happens. Thirdly, we're very restricted on what conditions we can apply. Fourthly, the amenity space sorry, the, the living space in some of these buildings is grossly inadequate. Uh, and finally, the amenity space and parking are normally inadequate as well. So uh, when considering this, do please, do please bear in mind that this type of building will probably be of a higher quality for occupants than those buildings that are already in the process of being converted around it. But of course, you must make your own assessment on that. So we're going to start Carl. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, I've got a few questions. Uh, they're all around affordable housing. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear. Um, this is an outline application. So it says the it's the principle of development and access only. So does that include affordable housing considerations or not? I.e. will these come forward again in the reserve matters? I'll, I'll provide some clarity on this. Sure. I, I've looked into this because I was quite surprised <coughs> that a site that is quite close to the town centre was not providing affordable housing. But it's been confirmed that this was requested by the council, that it should be taken in the form of an off-site uh, contribution. However, if this application was approved, uh, I believe it will be in the council's interest to perhaps open further discussions with the applicant to see whether that could be reviewed. But that is not something we're deciding tonight. Oh, yeah, of course, okay. Um, my next question was, uh, you kind of half answered that really, but um, I'd, I'd like an explanation why the off-site commuted sum uh, for affordable housing is acceptable. The National Planning Policy Framework says that commuted sums should be robustly justified. And I, I, I don't see anything in here that robustly justifies that. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to ask this question. I think we know the answer. I think all of us, despite the fact that the GPDO regulations, Class O, uh, residential from office. I, I think all of us hate this idea, um, uh, irrelevant of our political positions. Um, but how many affordable units are being built in those conversions that are taking place around the site? I think you've already said it's zero. There's none, none at all. Um, so here's one where we do actually have a chance to, to put some in. Um, the applicant uh, makes in its points here, there is a very real and demonstrated need for market and particularly affordable housing in the country, borough and Wokingham specifically. The proposal would contribute significantly to this need and should attract a very significant weight in the overall planning balance. Couldn't agree more. But this isn't affordable housing. This is a, a commuted sum. And I know as far as the law is concerned, that's the same thing. Um, but in terms of how we use it, I don't think this council has been using that money uh, in, a, in a great way. And I think here we have a chance to have 11 uh, flats. And that was going to be my, you know, I was thinking about what I might say tonight, and, and that's one of the things. And then this letter arrived from the applicant yesterday, which basically says that it was the council's decision. And that actually the applicant is basically saying they were happy with the, the idea of affordable housing, it would appear. 
Um, and we chose to, to kind of say, no, give us the cash instead. I, I, I just think that's a, a mistake. Um, you know. Carl, I referred to the possibility of reviewing that. My, my question then would be, how do we make that happen from here? Is there a way that it can be done by you know, putting something in this application that we can approve? I, I think my suggestion would be that an informative is added uh, that would encourage the council and the applicant to consider whether affordable housing could be included within the scheme as opposed to be provided through an off-site contribution. But I don't, we, as I always say at the start of this, it's not our role to redesign these applications, no, so we can't do that. But I think an informative would, would perhaps uh, indicate how the committee generally views about this. Okay. I hope so I'm the best not, we can do I'm is not, we I hope can I'm not thinking, uh, putting yeah. views that are not represented by other members of the committee. Yeah. So we can gently suggest it via informative, but that's about the limit of what we could actually do. Okay, fine, thanks. Um, yeah, I think that's all, all I've got to say on that for now. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. My concerns focus on two broad matters. First, design and amenity issues in the proposal. And second, amenities, access to facilities and services more generally. The proposal for one very large block raises many issues in my mind, including but not limited to a residential density that we're told is significantly greater than for the nearby office buildings already under conversion or with extent permission, a greater bulk than surrounding buildings, documented concerns relating to overlooking to the south, the north and the west, and a design that includes little or no soft landscaping to separate the car parking spaces from the roadway, and very little soft landscaping within the site as a whole. In summary, I consider this application in its present form to represent overdevelopment of the site. If there are members who agree with me, then I would recommend refusal, which would not preclude the applicants from submitting a revised proposal that could attempt to address issues such as those that I've mentioned. Moving on to amenities, access to facilities and services. I appreciate the comments made, by, uh, made on this matter by the agent. However, no development exists in a bubble. We are told that currently a net increase of 367 residential units on the business park site and nearby sites in this core employment area is anticipated. The requirements that this implies for all sorts of vital services is significant, including for all future residents if this development was to go ahead. The judgment that Leslie Searsfield should not uh, be included as outdoor amenity space because of the walking distance involved seems reasonable, but the application does not address the issue of a suitable alternative. Equally, there should be real concerns about provision of other vital amenities, including schools and surgeries. This is important not just for the quality of life of people moving into any new developments, but also impacts on those residents already living in, a, in the locality, who could suffer enormously as increased demand for key services outstrips supply. I'm not sure if provision of the kinds of um, services and facilities mentioned is a material consideration in the application before us, but it's certainly a very important issue, not only in relation to this site, but for sites across the borough. I think unless I'm correct, Andrew, that was more of a statement than a question. Um, I will just come back on a couple of points. You referred to landscaping. Landscaping is something that's covered under reserved matters. Don't forget, this is only an outline application at this stage. Um, you referred to all the buildings uh, that are being developed in that area. Obviously, as I've already mentioned, we don't see the benefit, of, nor do the residents who are going to be living in them in the future. They don't see any contribution from the developers of those units towards infrastructure. Uh, the only development towards the inf uh, infrastructure in that area would be coming from this particular scheme alone, because the other schemes that immediately surround it have been already agreed under permitted <coughs> development. Um, so the, the, the SIL payments are not forthcoming from those but would be forthcoming for these. So in essence, as I think you know, we have the second highest level of SIL contributions in the country and uh, therefore you could argue that this development is actually providing, providing some facilities that is not being provided by other developers in the area, but I take your point. Um, Stephen, next, I think. Thank, thank you very much, Chairman. 
Um, now there is an argument, um, it's not one I necessarily subscribe to, but there is an argument that um, we uh, in this council are, are confronted with a really difficult task of trying to find lots of new housing, um, which have been imposed upon us, um, and this at least makes a contribution to that. However, there is also a very compelling argument, which I think is rather stronger, that this is the loss of a core employment site. And to lose that permanently, which is what we would be doing with this, is, um, I, I think, highly questionable. If you assume that there will be no use required for this kind of core employment activity uh, for the foreseeable future, then perhaps this is acceptable. But it does strike me that there are inevitable um, there's a rhythm of, uh, of, of a demand, a contraction of demand, further demand, and we're actually now basically shutting this down as a, an option for a return to employment activity on this site, which I think is a great shame. Um, can I just pick up two other issues that have been raised already? The first one, um, I entirely support the idea of an informative on affordable housing. I would very much welcome that. I think the the key issue here that I think we're all trying to get to is that while the council's housing officers have a view of the, the, the borough's requirements as a whole, individual communities are anxious to secure affordable housing in their own communities for the people who live there. And and afraid commuted payments run against that. They're often just used somewhere else. Um, can I ask whether... Um, the concerns about the lack of amenity space, uh, I'm not talking about amenity now, but amenity space for particularly children to play in, is that something that we would expect to be indicated on an outline, or is it something that we would normally expect to come up in reserve matters? Well, again, could we at least add an informative that we would hope that the full application, when it comes forward, would include provision for amenity space, uh, because there is no indication of where that might be accommodated currently. I'll just add, the, the applicant has been forthcoming with a plan indicating um, adequately sized balconies or courtyards for every single unit, whereas the plan submitted under this application did not show that for every unit, they do now. And that's indicative of a development that could that, be achieved. That, that is something we're not just, it's not supposed to be covered today anyway. No, it's no, something under no. the reserve matter. I, I, so, it's, so it's a move in the right direction, presumably. It, well, well, but perhaps it is, but I mean, I'm not entirely sure um, balconies on high buildings are an ex ex entirely ideal uh, place for children to be playing. Um, so I'd still like the informative to go. I'm not sure quite what level of. Uh, occupancy by young children is, is normal in flats, but I, I have no idea on that. Um, I would just also draw attention that the you, you made reference, I think, to the um, the loss of employment, key employment areas. Um, I, I'm afraid I've not been able to find it in here, but I'm sure when I originally read this, there was an indication of some 80,000, uh, I'm afraid I don't know whether it was square metres, probably square metres of office space in, in, the, uh, in the borough that was unoccupied or undeveloped at this stage? Sorry? Sorry? Paragraph 16. Thank you for that. Let's refer back to that. Yeah, okay. It, said, it says, um, as of October 19, there's a high vacancy rate of office accommodation of various sizes in Woking with total 29 offices and 84,000 square feet of floor space. Um, so I think there is an indication here. That is probably why we're being deluged with permitted development approach. Um, I've already passed a view on the, the difference or the attractions of a, of a conventional planning application on the site. My point, Chairman, was whether we consider it to be a permanent shift or a, simply a cyclical one. And if it's a cyclical one, then we're, we're precluding... We are, but obviously uh, commercial thing, reasons would have come into play because the site's been vacant since 2011 and uh, presumably whoever owns the site as an investor uh, has seen that it's not worth turning it into offices in that period, which suggests there isn't the demand for it because most people don't want to lose money on a site, I would imagine. But still. So if we now move on to uh, uh, Rochelle next. I think we've got, yeah. Well, several things. I prefer this particular type of development 
compared to the office conversions, which have absolutely no sale, no money to put anything, but they still put the same number of strain on the resources in the area. I will say that they will be providing SIL, and unfortunately, uh, doctor's surgeries and the availability of GPs has no relevance in planning as far as that goes. We can't actually make them put more doctor's surgeries in. Um, I'm sure Arborfield has that fun part that they've been trying to get a surgery there for a long time and not having it with 3,000 homes, not um, a few. Uh, I do like the idea of having affordable homes in the area and in this estate because I really don't like the fact of commuted sums which are not used to build new affordable homes. A lot of times they're being used in other places and other th for other purposes or renovating existing homes, but we need to have more affordable homes in this area, not less affordable homes in this area. And the fact that the developer is willing to put 11, home, 11 homes in this development is a good thing, not a bad thing. I also question about page 147, paragraph 1 says, that's 106. It's not talking about sale. Any particular reason for that? That will probably be other um, legal agreement, Mary. Would it? The, 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 on the bottom of uh, bottom of page one four seven, there's a reference to one oh six agreements. Um, yeah, that's the affordable housing. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Because uh, that's not covered under the sale. At this point, there are nine existing uh, conversions in this area, and this one is actually a much better conversion if we have to have one. If we have to have a conversion, it's much better to have an application where we can actually get sale and get contributions to, to make it decent for the re existing residents and for the new residents, as opposed to the other idea of changing the offices into flats, little rabbit, hole, little rabbit hutches, and it's not the best thing in the world. Um, honestly, core employment doesn't seem to be wanted here. There's 25% vacancy. Uh, if you really wanted it, there'd be a 5% vacancy or 2% vacancy. Uh, there seems to be something going on here that this is being converted. If you look on Molly Miller's Lane, there's an awful lot of flats that have come up in the last few years, and all of the buildings that used to be employment are not there anymore. Maybe they want to go to different places for employment, not here. I don't know. Um, it's more statements than actually questions at this point, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> you seem to have a few of them today. And I do agree that we should have an informative, definitely, about the affordable homes. I'm sorry, but I don't like the idea of asking, telling them we don't want them. We need them. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I endorse your, your comments at the beginning about uh, the permitted development sites. So we're left with those and potentially this site uh, and on top of the immediate <coughs> amenity space and play area it does strike me and it always struck me even when it was a, a total employment area that the lack of permeability onto open space uh, w was, was evident w where this site we're talking about is really quite close to Leslie Se Sears field to Victory field to Blagrove Lane uh, and I don't know whether there is a possibility as we go towards the uh, reserve matters on behalf of all these sites that there could be some pedestrian permeability to open space for exercise, for getting to a green area without having to get into a car. Uh, and whether that could, I don't know, is that something we could put in an informative from this? As you know, we are in the borough looking uh, greenways and some of those have already been installed to provide connectivity between areas um, uh, which allows people to, to, to travel between areas without going on the road so through cycling and walking um, we could certainly you know we could put that in as an informative as well to provide guidance to the planning authority and the applicant as to our preferred thinking on this yeah, uh, I, I think greenways are probably a long way off in terms of what we're talking about here, Chairman, what we're really talking about is to the south of the site, uh, you, you've got a walled employment area. Can we br 
get a gap in the wall, <laughs> to put it simply. Yeah, the, the, it, it really goes back to the old nine or ten houses in the histories of what, what you get when you, the numbers go up. And then just looking at the picture 155, I, I've counted 342 units. But the dilemma is that they're all individual applications and they're all individual from each other. So therefore, uh, we don't, I don't believe we have a mechanism by which we can lump together conditions. If this was 342 houses going onto one side, there are certain things we could do. But the way it's broken down, there are things we can't do. Um, permitted development and NPPF current legislation, even in industrial areas, allow this type of thing to go on. So we've got very little, little control over it. I mean, having said that, I'm, I'm not, um, I, I actually think residential and industrial can work well together. I mean, it's quite common on the continent. And um, it's, it's, it's near the town centre, it's near the railway station, it's near supermarkets. So in terms of accessibility, it does provide a fair amount of the facilities. I agree with your point on uh, affordable housing, and I think that is a point we need to make in the report, and I agree with Angus's point on connectivity to open spaces, because to me that's the, that's the biggest weakness in the whole system, is <coughs> the connectivity to open spaces. Um, otherwise, I, I am subject to those two points, I will support the planning application. Thank you. Uh, Yes, I'm aware this is an outline only, so some of the comments uh, or questions I have uh, would be answered, I suspect, at a uh, reserved matter stage. Um, but even at this stage, you have to say roughly how many you're going to build and where the entrances are and so on. I assume there's only one entrance to this site. That's what I can see from the, from the diagram. Come in the bottom left and you go all the way around. Yeah. So the wide bit of the road on this this plan here is by the entrance it goes up and then turns left at the bottom and then there's a narrower bit further up I guess um, so same questions I asked on a previous application if bin lorries and delivery men or whatever arrive can they is that road wide enough to permit them to go in and out in a forward direction to be able to turn around and come out or do they have to go one way that's what that's the first question yeah. Um, the access coming off Fish Ponds Road is about seven metres wide, so it's quite wide. And then the, the, the roads around the building are six metres wide, so that's to enable the cars to reverse adequately. So that's why... So it's when, the when bin lorries or delivery people arrive, I was concerned, and larger vehicles. Yeah. It's not just bin lorries. Is there space, do you think, for them to... You would say mm -hmm. there is? Yeah, it should be adequate, yeah. OK. Um, I'm not sure if I'm reading this horribly. The road at the top looks much narrower, doesn't it? It's um, quite wider down here. And the, does the road go the same width round the other side? Because if, if I'm looking at this properly, it looks like that's a narrower road at the other side, above the flats, beyond the flats. It's the same width both sides, is it? Are you talking about around the building or yeah, outside the Yeah, this is the building the and there's the road coming in. Is it at the top of that diagram there? That road at the top is the same width. It's part of the same site, is it? That, you'll see two lines there. The, the bottom line is the boundary of the site. Yeah. And the line next door is... Um, so that is part is of the road site. ...is the next door site. So there is okay. a shared width of the six metres, to make up the six metres. Six metres wide. Six metres between the two parking spaces, but it is across two sites. Yeah. Um, it's a shared surface, which means that it's pedestrians and, they, and vehicles, but presumably they have to put their rubbish out somewhere for it to be collected. So does that mean that shared surface is going to have bins or recycling boxes on it, as well as people walking, as well as vehicles? Which there is, there's four entrances to the ground floor of the building, and then there's pedestrian pathway around the edge of the building, so there will be some walking on the, the roadway shared surface to get to the bin store. OK, That's so on the day of bin collections or whatever, it'll, those are the days you need to be particularly careful, I imagine. Um, I've got mixed feelings about this. Um, there are a few good points and a couple of which are less good. I think the fact that the sill will be on it, which you don't get on all those other buildings in the area, is a good thing. Uh, affordable housing is um, a, a useful thing. 
Uh, they are, in fact, surrounded by other houses looking at the map, say they're not the only place in that business park. There are other houses around it. Um, parking, I think there's 70 bedrooms if you add up all the places. And it's, um, Malcolm, the parking is fully compliant. So yes, no it's 59 spaces, yeah. so I've said this, yeah. so I think that's probably just about OK. Um, garden or amenity space was one of my questions. Um, what is it per property? Is it... Uh, I think that will come in under reserve matters, Malcolm. Yeah, but it will be something for each. We talked about having an informative on that. OK, fine. Um, and, yes, there's only one entry exit. I've covered that, the road width. Uh, that's it, basically. I think there are pluses and minuses. Overall, I think it's uh, I'm more likely to be voting in favour because it, there are more pluses than minuses, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my only concern is... The buildings seem to be too high, but otherwise I'm in support of this development because our borough does need one and two bedroom houses where we are short of, in yes. my opinion. So therefore I will support subject to the height restriction, if possible, to amend. Just on um, page 150, um, I think, well, sorry, no, it's not on page 150, I'm not sure where it was, but we have had confirmation that the building is 12.1 metres high and some of the adjacent building, one of the adjacent buildings is 14 metres high. So this is not as tall as some of the other buildings in the area. But clearly, containing the number of units it does, it does have a certain amount of bulk to it uh, and mass. But it is, it is less high than some of the other buildings <coughs> in the immediate vicinity. So it would be difficult for us to say that that was significantly out of character. OK. Right, Chris. Uh, just to check, it would be possible if we refuse this application for an office spot to be submitted as, uh, to gain consent and then permitted development rights to apply to that to convert to residential. Just sure, that would be a fallback position. Covered that one, we? No, to, uh, to benefit from permitted development, the office needed to have existed in 2013. Okay. Yep, as I said. Carl, you want to come back? Briefly, please. Just a quick, couple of quick clarifications. Um, I think I'm 100% sure on this, but I just want to make sure. The reserve matters application is going to come back to us in committee. Uh, if, you, if you so wish, it would normally come because this is yeah, a major application. Major. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And will we be able to discuss affordable housing when it does? We're not going to have ruled ourselves out by agreeing this one. Uh, well, Because oh, I've been bitten by that before. Yep. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Mary, could you clarify on that? Um, the, the legal agreement is for now, for the outline. So it is a bit set in stone. Um, you'd have very limited um, grounds to change it once you've decided what you want today, if you're, if you're fine to proceed. Yeah. Hmm. OK. Yeah, I, I was just, just looking at that to see whether there's a, a, a way we could ash, add a, a recommendation. You see the recommendations on page 142 is whether we added, uh, may, sorry, yeah, the, uh, sorry, do you wish to add something pertinent to this? All right, thank you for that. Uh, if you just, panel, if you just bear with me a moment, I'll just speak to Mary on this. Mary. Okay, uh, I think we might have a way forward. We we could, we we could suggest. Actually, in fact, you, you put that quite succinctly. Would you just repeat what you said, if you can remember? <laughs> um, you can have a resolution, if you're minded to approve, that the section one hundred 
Section 106 for affordable housing provides the affordable housing on site. I think it's a different way to the same route, but we could amend uh, recommendation A to a legal agreement to secure affordable housing and an employment skills plan. Something that actually addresses this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Perhaps just one moment. I'll just put it in a moment to just secure affordable housing. Yeah. Yeah. So it would the just to confirm then now the recommendation would read a legal agreement to secure affordable housing and the employment skills plan and the conditions and informatives. And our informatives uh, will refer to our preference for on-site provision of affordable housing, that the reserve matters adequately covers amenity space and looks to see whether there's any uh, improved access to the connectivity for uh, to open spaces. Okay, right. Uh, uh, before we go any further, does any member wish to put an alternative proposal? Okay, so I think we have a way forward. Um, does everybody understand what we're voting on and what we've agreed to? Yeah. Okay, so members, could you please indicate whether you're prepared to support application 192852 as amended? And that is unanimous. So that is approved, and that is the final application tonight. Um, do we have indications of any site visits, uh, preemptive? Right, thought we did. Yes, uh, if we could just quickly do that, sorry? Will you do a side visit? Uh, well, this is February, not March. Oh, yes, oh, sorry, yes, sorry. yes, no, it's February. Um, just to be clear, members, uh, I've lost it on here. Where's my site visit? Right, preemptive site visit. Right, mem mem members, um, we'll be arranging the site visit to... Uh, sorry, if you can hear me, 